bosses, it's Winnie from Asian Boss. Did you know that in Japan, only 2% of newborns per year are actually mixed Japanese? By now, it's pretty well known that Japan is considered one of the most culturally and ethnically homogeneous countries in the world, with over 98% of Japanese citizens being considered ethnic Japanese. We talked to a group of half Japanese, also considered halfus, on our channel before to explore their unique experiences and struggles being half Japanese in Japan. But this time, you'll get to hear from the former Miss World Japan winner, Priyanka Yoshikawa, who's the very first half Indian and half Japanese to win the competition in 2016. The fact that she was mixed wasn't always well received. So we asked her about how the acceptance of halfus have changed over time and how she's using her platform to promote diversity. So here is her story. So thank you so much for sitting down with us today, Priyanka. Um, from our understanding, you are the first half Indian and half Japanese to win the Miss World Japan in 2016. But for our international audience who are not as familiar with you, can you give us a brief introduction? Yeah, sure. Um, well, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm Priyanka Yoshikawa, and like you said, I did win Miss World Japan in 2016, and mm -hmm. I was the first biracial to win it. My age right now is currently 27, so I won the title when I was 22. And um, I'm currently the CEO of East Hemp Company, where we produce products, um, CBD-based products for skincare and um, supplements and all those you know, lifestyle brands. As you mentioned, it's been five years since you won the Miss World Japan mm -hmm. title. How has things changed for you? Do you think people still, you know, like recognize you? How big was this title for you? Um, I would say in 2016, it was more like it was more happening, I guess. I got interviewed a lot because I was the first biracial for Miss World um, and, you know, that made me become more, I guess, um, in getting involved myself in more public speaking and those sort of things. And then, you know, starting a business as well. So people do still recognize me because I am on TV and I do those work still. Um, but um, not like, you know, you turn on the TV and, you know, I'm on the interviews every day. You know, it was a very boost up of my mm -hmm. career because I was just a model for like five years. And then, you know, I was on campaigns and those things, but it's, I never really had a voice, you know, I, I always wanted to have a voice, but I never really had that until I won the title. I talk a lot about, you know, half is living in Japan and I still take in those interviews like today as well. Mm -hmm. But, um, so that's like my core, um, I, I guess like a topic that I still continue to talk about because I feel there is a, still a huge need in Japan and, you know, um, not just Japan, but diversity and all these things is a very international topic that we are focused on. Well, so before we talk about the beauty pageant, um, you have a very unique background. Mm -hmm. You're half Indian and half Japanese. Is this quite, I guess, rare in Japan? I think so. Like, I don't have a lot of friends that are Indo-Japanese mix. Um, I do have a couple of friends that are like Bangladesh mix or Pakistan, but not really a lot of Indian. Yeah, but how did your parents meet since this one is Japanese? Oh. My dad um, always wanted to go overseas and he was a huge fan of Japan. I, for, I never really asked why, but he was planning to go to Germany or Japan and he shows Japan and then um, he didn't speak the language. So he started to go to community school at the same time, go to like a you know normal college or something. Um, and then my mom had a part-time job teaching Japanese at the community school mm. and um, she wasn't the teacher for his class but they met they met in that um, school and then I guess they just kicked it off and they got married and wow then, and then they had me <laughs> did they ever tell you if that kind of international marriage was was difficult back in the days like people would say like oh like you're not supposed mm -hmm. to get married my father's side was absolutely fine but my mom's side um, was a little bit against her getting married to my father. Um, I don't know if it, the only reason was because he was a foreigner or I think it had to do something with it. Mm. Um, 
but I mean, they, they got married after all, so. My mom loves India. She's been okay. traveling to India before even she got married to my dad or like before she met him. So for her, cultural difference isn't, was not an issue, mm -hmm. but um, living in Japan with a foreign husband did give her issues because, um, you know, for her it wasn't an issue, but just as living in Japan, it was really hard to get a place to rent um, because in a foreign name. Even when she is Japanese. Yeah, yeah. Recently, it's not a problem, but like 20, 30 years ago, it was very hard. Because like, you change your family name? It's not it? just about my mom. It's because oh. you rent it through your father's, I mean, my dad's name or something, right? Because you're right. in the family. So, because right in Japan, you can't get married in a different surname. If you go in, um, to like a real estate office, they're like, oh no, like they don't even talk to you. That's what my mom said. Like she went to multiple places and they rejected before even asking or like before even they were able to say, okay, we want to, you know, rent these kind of places. So I guess like if you come from a very high end place, it, it's not much of an issue because a company is backing up you. But my dad wasn't that, so it was very hard. So those things did happen. Why do you think they were so like, against foreigners even just renting a house. Japan has been very closed country, it's an island. Um, even we only have 2% of, you know, biracial kids every year. Um, that just, you know, proves how much it's still very closed. Um, and we have a lot of foreigners coming in, we have a lot of biracials, but I mean, when you compare it to, let's say, the States, or, you know, mm -hmm. it's very different. I'm not saying the States is great, and Japan is not. Um, it's not that part to compare. But um, I, Japan was, like, just, they're not really used to it. And if you follow the history, like, it's not. Like, even the word hafu comes from a very um, uh, racist place. Like, I mean, I don't try to use the word hafu when I speak in Japanese I use it mix or double because I mean hafu is actually means that you're less than a human because you're half yeah, of a human <laughs> yeah Japanese blood mm. if you're 100 percent you're human but if you're not it's mm. hafu so you're so it means all those things so when you think about that not being able to rent a place and those you know it's not of them they don't realize that they're doing something very racist because japan is very under the carpet your dad is indian your mom is japanese yep. and you've grew up where have you been growing up i was born in tokyo and then i went to the states when i was in elementary Oh, okay. And then I spent about a year in India as well, and I came back to Japan when I was like 11 or 10, I think. And then you've been in Japan? Yeah, since, since then, then, yeah. Wow, so you, because you speak English so fluently, and obviously yeah. you, you speak Japanese as well. Um, I guess, what, what other languages do you speak? I hope I can say, but... Um, <laughs> I speak Bengali, mm. but it's very poor lately. Like because I study, I mean, I didn't really study Bengali. I was just living in India when I was nine, and I just picked it up. So it's very, let's say, like a very casual Bengali, I guess. You know, elementary level. But yeah, but I can understand and everything in mm -hmm. there. And then for Hindi, I don't really speak, so mm. mainly it's three languages. Wow, that, that's a lot. When you came back to Japan, you said at the age of 11 was Yeah, I think that? it was like 11. And then you just, you know, went into a local school. Mm -hmm. How was that like for you? It was very different. <laughs> I was um, the only hafu in my school, and I didn't speak as good Japanese than I speak now. Mm -hmm. I couldn't read and write, so that was the main Thing for me I couldn't read and write but I'm studying in Japanese so and then the teachers will ask me to read you know the books mm -hmm. but I'm like I can't read the kanji the Chinese characters so I'll have to ask every single time um, and then that I don't think that was the actual reason that I got bullied but it did make um, one of like some of the reasons you know for me to stick out in a way and then I had I'm, I'm brown, so I have dark skin than other people in my class. Let's say you were me and I bumped into you on the like hallway or like I accidentally touched you or what, like I'll wipe it, like my classmates will wipe it. So it's like, I'm like, I'm just breathing and I'm just living and trying to enjoy my life and I'm treated like a germ and I'm like, 
hello, like, you know, I am very clean. So yeah, I mean, I got bullied having a foreign dad. Um, I really feel horrible that I felt that way once in my life, but I was a little bit, not shy, but um, I felt like, oh, I don't want my dad to come to school, you know? because I didn't want people to think that I was more weirder or whatever it was at that time. And then um, if it's like free seating yeah. class, nobody will sit with me and the teacher will come up and she's like, are you okay? And I'm like, what kind of a teacher are you? You know? And I'm like, um, yeah, I guess. Like, you know, it's like, why can you not notice what, a, what kind of a situation I'm at when the teacher is in their 30s and I'm still like 11, you know, and a, she comes or he comes to me and asks me, are you okay? And then if I was a teacher, I would probably stop that system and, you know, from next week. But she'll continue to do that. So I'll always sit alone. You know? Is it because she was not aware or she just didn't want to... She doesn't want to deal with it. They, they didn't want to deal with it. So nobody helped me and then I kind of gave up on telling my parents as well because I didn't want them to get involved. So I just kept it with me for a year. So I your did parents didn't know that you were bullied? They didn't, they didn't. Well, wow, how yeah. did, were you able to hide it so well from them? I mean... I just pretended. Mm -hmm. They didn't know anything. I was like, oh yeah, those are all my friends. Mm -hmm. It's very typical for um, a kid to get bullied, I mean, being bullied to say that. But specifically, if I say more details, these two, three kids, I think my classmate said, like for me to die or something mm -hmm. and it was a sign language so I didn't realize and my classmate that was sitting behind me was like Priyanka I think they're saying like die in sign language and I'm like really like why would I die for a stranger you know I'm like I'm not and it didn't make sense at all mm -hmm. and I, I didn't feel like I was getting bullied at that time I just felt like I was a little bit I felt an, as an outsider but I wasn't feeling I was bullied um, and then I go back to home and I'm like, I was like, mom, you know, like what happened to me today? It was really awkward. Like, I, I don't get it, but apparently like, I forgot the sign language, but this means die. Mm. And they were doing it to me. And my mom's like, what? And she's like, give me their names and their number. And then she just calls them mm. and she's like, what kind of an education or a household do you have? And I saw that. So I know I knew that my mom or my dad is going to like, oh, I don't know what level he's going to go into if he knew that I was getting bullied. So I, I, I didn't I wanted him to be out. Mm. And then but I knew my mom was going to be very mad as well. She gets obviously emotional about for me. Right. I'm her daughter. Mm. But that never really changed the situation. It will be changed in that moment when my mom is talking to the parent and the kid and yeah. the kid will be like, oh, I'm sorry, but I didn't mean that. I didn't do that. Everybody will be friendly in that moment, but at school, they're not. So I knew that even if I told my parents, nothing is going to change. So that was that. But I talked about this in my TED talk, um, but they actually wasted a great amount of years in my life because that full year of me getting bullied like I should have not you know given up on things you know I should have had a really nice school life but I didn't I wasted my lifetime through a third person right and then right. that still affects me because even though I'm 27 being having that experience still frightened frightened me sometimes you know in ways of thinking so how I'll be like, if somebody is like whispering or something, let's say, you know, it feels like they're talking about me or... What do you think they're talking about? Something that, that has to do with disliking me, I guess, because mm -hmm. it's like, even though I'm very more, I can express myself more and I'm obviously talking about all of these things for years, just as a mindset, it does deep down, like if you say something harsh to somebody, yeah. it might not add, like affect you as much as you are affecting the person that was told. So a lot of kids that go through, you know, getting bullied, it stays with them, a scar deep down. So it just, you know, in ways it can like flashback, I guess, you know. As you kind of move, um, you know, 
continue your study in Japan, did the issue just kind of got better with time? Yeah, it did get better with time. But I did still st struggle a little bit in high school, but not about bullying or anything. It was just more of the Japanese education system that I couldn't really deal with. I'm like, why can't I dye my hair? Like, um, you know, it's like, why do I have to wear um, navy socks? that I have to buy at school, like all these little things, like how does that affect to my education? Like, mm. and I had all these questions and I was like, because my personality was going back to normal again, because <laughs> I was like pressing it for two years or three. Um, and then high school, boom, I'm like, I'm back, you know, I'm like <laughs> this is me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I did struggle a little bit. And then I, and then I started working in the entertainment industry. So it was like very, easy for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. So despite your experiences in Japan as a child, you competed in the Miss World Japan in 2016. What made you decide to attend the competition? Oh, well, I never thought that I was going to compete in a beauty pageant. I knew about Miss World because it's very big in India, but um, Japan was like, Japan is not a beauty pageant, like huge on beauty pageants, you know compared to other countries and even just in Asia as well. So I never thought about it. And even my parents were like, you know, like it's Miss Japan. Like I think not saying that you're not enough, like you're absolutely great. But like just for that title, I think it's more of like being fully Japanese girls because nobody actually won it, right? And then I was in Tokyo Fashion Week and I met the organization, a guy that was scouting for Miss World Japan, and he was like, you should, you know, you should compete. And I'm like, really? <laughs> like, really? I'm like, do you realize, you know, I'm, I'm biracial? Like, is that fine? He's like, yeah, it's fine. You should, you should. And um, I was like, okay, let me, let me think about it. Um, and I wanted to be in the entertainment industry and be successful in it, but not just, you know, being on print ads. Like, I wanted to have a voice. I wanted to have some sort of influence through all the work that I do. Um, and so I thought a beauty pageant might be a good way to start that. Um, and I competed and then at first I thought it was, oh, first runner up is enough. Mm -hmm. And then I competed and I'm like, oh no, no, if you're going to do it, you need to aim for number one. And then, um, luckily I was able to become. Did you tell your parents yeah. when you were going to compete or you just kind of like send in the registration and then see how it goes on, on your own yeah. and kept it a secret. The latter one. Um, I, <laughs> I didn't tell my father until yeah. I became the finalist. I told my mom a little bit that I was going to compete and then I didn't tell her much. Yeah. Um, and then I became the finalist and then two weeks after I called them and we were having lunch. My dad thought I was getting married because I was like, dad, I have to tell you something. <laughs> very important. Yeah, very important. Like you need to meet me for lunch. And then I was, he's like, lunch, okay. And my mom comes and I'm like, so dad, like he, he's always like, he's like, he's a little nervous right. that day. And I'm like, why are you so nervous? He's like, okay, so what's, what's the topic? What, what do you need to talk about? You're not pregnant, right? And I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm like, I'm the finalist of Miss World Japan. He's like, oh my God, Miss World. Because for him, like he knew all he these. Knew so yeah it was Whoa. very exciting for them essentially you're half indian so you can probably compete for miss oh no 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 no, no because i don't have a nationality and i don't have an indian nationality oh yeah i can only compete for japan what were the key judging criteria for the competition so there's five categories that you always have to enter is like there's a top model so you do walking and you know just modeling stuff and then there's sports and then um charity so the beauty with a purpose and then social media like um the voting and then um, talent so for miss world it's usually instruments singing or dancing i suck at all of those three so i didn't i was like i i said i can't do it but i can um, for japan you can do something else so i did that so those five things and then the rest of it is interviews there's workshops every week or something and then there's judges that have been judging how you are reacting to things how you're you know um being how you act with the other competitors every pageant okay. has a cause mm -hmm. for miss world we have a slogan called beauty with a purpose and i love it because like it's, they all say like you know being beautiful like you guys are all beautiful like and i mean we all are like even if you like your face or not, you know, it's not about that. <laughs> Everybody's beautiful and everybody is very valuable, um, but, and they should be valued, but um, 
just in the past, it's like, okay, you're a model, that's fine. I want to know like what you want to do in life. That's、mm -hmm. like the Miss World interviews. Like they're like, okay, so what are you focused on? What's your purpose? Not just about the looks is really、um, connected to the Miss World, though. Interesting, because when we look at like let's say Miss Korea, there's very specific stereotype that people have. Right, you you need to be this skinny. You need to lose this much weight. Um, which is usually, I guess, under underweight. For things like that, do they have that kind of criteria for your competition as well, or they don't tell you upfront? But like, it's like they nobody is really oversized, to be honest. You know, I mean, I I lost like six pound, not six pound, twelve pounds.、Um, And then I regained it now, so I gained like fourteen pounds. But、um, yeah, like those things. So I mean, I don't know if that's actually a great symbol that they're showing through beauty pageants of being fit and you know a certain way of being pretty.、Um, because when it goes into diversity, it's not right. I mean, why do you need to make a different category of a plus size beauty pageant? Why can't it be the same? You know, why can't transgenders, you know, compete? Why can't you know these questions do come up because、um, history? I mean, like just culture is changing, and、um, you know, it's just it's getting upgraded and renewed. You know,、yeah. it's not like the olden days. So, but yeah, not as much as. Like how you said about Miss Korea. Was there a specific key factor that you think made you win the competition? I think I was able to speak well.、Um, my speech was very simple, but be after, like, I won the title and I became a judge for certain pageants. I did realize、um, you can't really be fake. You know, if you're going to be fake, you have to be really good at it. <laughs> Um, and you can't just be very selfish. You can't say, "I think I deserve this crown because I'm the best fit for it." You know, you have to say why you're so good for this,、um, what you want to do, and like. And it doesn't have to be just for. You can't really say it for just beauty pageants. It's in general in、yeah. life. Like you have to、general、have、interviews. that、yeah. core. And as long as you, because all the answers are always inside of you, so you just have to meditate on them. Like you have to talk to yourself and get all those answers why you want to do it. And so I think the concentration that goes with it does change how you form things or how you say it. So the speech did really make an impact, I think, because I did get a lot of comments、um, after I won the pageant. They're like, you know, your speech was like the best and stuff. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. So、um, when you actually got the first prize,、mm -hmm. how did you feel? I mean, it was five years ago, so you、mm -hmm. might not remember. <laughs> But if we go back to that time,、um, I had no idea what happened to me. To be honest, I was like, because how they did it was a little cruel. Like、Aww. it was ten, in a way, like ten top ten, right? So it's ten girls, and usually it's like second runner up, first runner up, and then. You know, you、mm. win. For Miss World, we had for Japan, we had little different prizes like top model. People are getting called, called, and then it was me or this other girl that a lot of people thought that was gonna win. And then they called my name, and then they called her name as well after because if they announced the first runner-up, so it was really confusing. <laughs> and so I thought I wasn't gonna win anything. And then I, my name was called, and I'm like, really? Like I was like, I really had no idea what happened to me, and then I was really awkward. So I mean, I was really surprised in a good way. I was really happy because I, I felt that I deserved it because I did put a lot of effort and energy and love into it. But yeah, after you won the competition, what were people's reaction? I got a lot of negative comments. At the same time, I got positive.、Um, I knew that it was gonna, you know, happen. You know, if I won it, I knew that I was gonna get some sort of backlashes and stuff, and which I did.、Um, but at the same time, I got a lot of good ones too. When they, I got comments, messages of saying that I was hope because it showed them how Japan was changing. I mean, I got to know at that time, but a lot of parents or foreign families and living in Japan.、Um, Face some sort of anxiety, or they worry about their child, you know, going into school or living up in Japan、mm -hmm. as、um, a foreign child or you know mixed race. So when they say, you know, 
it's hope and like we're really you know grateful or you know those things it really hit me i was like i didn't think i was gonna be thanked you know because when i was doing the pageant it was not for you know to save biracial kids in japan right. i didn't think that i would have that kind of a role to play in life so that was really you know ins i mean i got inspired by those but um the negative ones i mean it's just you know <laughs> not fully japanese um the one is like just about like you know body smell like yeah a lot of people like japanese people if you stereotype it have less body smell than compared to other countries um so for some reason they thought that there was like a comment of like that it's like oh she's partly indian so maybe she has a strong body smell that's like so rude i'm like come on like come come in front of me like yeah. <laughs> i what smell quite nice <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but something like that or it's just like those funny ones you know my parents as well like for certain people they don't like how i look so they're like oh she's so ugly or you know like if Mr. Pan is going to be so exotic like I want them to stop the passion like you know it's like they're like they're not it's, there's comments of like okay like personally I'm not against biracial but for a pageant representing Japan I want it to be purely Japanese so if they're going to continue to choose people that are biracial I would like them to stop doing Mr. Pan pageants you know those things it did happen a lot of people are talking about what I am and I'm like, you guys can think what I am. Like, I, you can define me, you know, it's fine. But I define myself too. So I took like 23 and me and I took a DNA test. And I was um, way more than just being Indian and Japanese. So I was <laughs> like, if you want, you know, if you want that, I can show it to you. Um, but yeah, a lot of people didn't want, you know, biracial as a Mr. Pat. How did you deal with those negative comments? I didn't care at all. I but you still read them. I read them I, because it doesn't bother me. That's the thing. I Aww. don't, bo it doesn't bother. Like, I mean, some of them, if they say like, she's so ugly, I'm like, oh, that hurts. <laughs> you know, Aww. it happens. But like in ways like that, like, I mean, it's still like I can joke around about mm -hmm. it um, because I don't know them. A stranger is just talking on the internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, well, I mean, sorry that you're feeling that way but there's a lot of people that support me and i would love to love those people than the ones but some of them can be like it's not as negative you can learn from some of them because they actually say oh how she phrased this is like in ways for me living in japan and being very domestic um that mindset wasn't there so when she says it like this it hurts and this you know mm -hmm. those things are like something that i can learn in general how do you think the Japanese people see hafu people? I guess there is always a filter of me being hafu or um, there are certain things that let's say like I will dress um, a little bit like revealing in a way or something <laughs> but it's fine because I'm a hafu. Okay so that's something good about being your hafu. Yeah if you're a hafu you're kind of like a gaijin mm. so it's okay like they were like oh no but she's a hafu so like you know bear with it or something like that um so i guess you can kind of go a, a little bit outside the norm would they i don't know would they expect that you speak english or like yeah so ariana right uh, from miss universe and yeah. we're friends so ariana and i and her husband now um her husband is from hong kong so was, he looks more very asian than us um, and we were at a restaurant and we get English menus and he gets a Japanese menu. But he can't, he doesn't really speak good Japanese. And we're like, um, <laughs> where, are the Japanese <laughs> where are the Japanese? He's the foreigner. Um, so I guess like it's just, you know, a filter that without even thinking. So sometimes I'm speaking in Japanese, but a waiter will speak to me in English. And I'm like, no, I'm speaking Japanese. Like, So that still happens. It does happen, yeah. Wow. Do you feel like things have been changing in Japan also in the mm -hmm. past few years? Um, definitely I do feel um, little by little. <laughs> Japan takes a lot of time to change. Mm. Um, it does do have to do a lot with history. The older ages are weren't mm. really used to hafus or you know yeah. international. You know Japan becoming more international, I guess. But our generation doesn't like they don't even 
think about it as much, right? Like they're open to it. More likely they want to study overseas or it's more easier to go. So I think in ways like in the modern days, it's changing more mm -hmm. and it's expect, accepting. It's just the gap between, I guess, the older generation, maybe the politicians, you know, um, because Japan, all, most of the politicians are very old. So how they, what they say and the, how our generation says are very different, yeah. I think. Because we're kind of going into an era where um, it's it's really not about nationality or countries. It's more of like coexisting, coming together, oneness. You know, it's not it's not separating. That's like going against where we're supposed to actually be heading. It's been five years yes. um, since you won the beauty pageant. What have you been up to? I established two companies in this five years. I started. Two. Yeah, I started my first company when my reign ended as Miss Japan. It was always just something that I chose in a very young age. I was going to become a model. I was going to go into the entertainment industry and I was going to start a company before 25. And then I was going to, you know, that was like my life plan. So I just followed a life plan that I decided in a very young age, like 15 or something. Wow. But I just don't want to sell a random product, you know? I want to sell something that I feel connected to and I have a message that I want to um, showcase and I want to spread and influence through it. Um, and then it led me to um, the brand that I have called Mikomi, but um, it's under a company called East Temp Company. And yeah, I've been running it for two and a half years now. Wow, but, yeah. so can you tell us a little bit about the company? Oh, yeah, yeah. One of our brand is called Mikomi and we're trying to develop a I started a new brand, so, um, but Eastham Company, our company is based around CBD and hemp um, and our brand story is dedicated to diversity um, and uh, so we have a really beautiful brand story and, but we are introducing CBD products now and I thought, you know, Japan is a very workaholic country as well. We need more Zen power. <laughs> so I thought CBD is a great match for Japan and I had a lot of breakouts and um, CBD products really helped me. And I was looking into Japan and CBD was legal. So I was like, okay, but there's not really so many CBD skincare. Skincare is a personal time of taking care of your skin and it's, you know, you're actually raw, like it's taking care of yourself. And I always thought diversity um, does connect to self-love and self-acceptance uh, and coexisting with others. So to coexist, you need to love yourself first, otherwise you can't really love others. Mm -hmm. CBD itself, it's legal in yes. Japan. Um, but I guess, why is it not that accepted yet in Japan then? Um, well, there's a lot of legal issues. Um, well, CBD comes from the hemp plant, yeah. right? Um, or there is CBD and marijuana as well. Japan is a very, very hardly against weed. Um, so when the ingredient CBD comes from it, it does go under the law of drugs. Um, so just CBD itself is legal, but there are a lot of restrictions that you have to follow. And just in Japan, com the community in Japan itself is against weed, right? Because we've been partly brainwashed a little bit and partly educated that weed is dangerous. So think about if a CBD com is, is coming from that category of a plant, a lot of people get scared. So it's just, I think it's just a lack of education around mm. um, that plant. So they just, you mentioned that until 25, um, you wanted to definitely have a business. Mm -hmm. So now you have a business. What's after this? So I definitely want to grow the brand more. I want people to know about our brand story as well as the product because we're selling products and we have amazing skincare. And I really can say it from, you know, not just because it's my brand, it's, it's actually everybody's brand, but um, like we've, got really good feedback. So I want to grow more internationally. I want our philosophy, our vision, and our mission to be a lot of people's and we want to build that community more. Um, and then when the community grows, we want to have more events, like mindfulness events, retreats, yoga programs, um, to actually more communicate with the community. So that's one that I want to grow. But in my, um, early, before I 
go into my mid 30s um, planning to start a, another business that involves hopefully children um, I said a little bit briefly before um, earlier today that I don't I, I never really thought about the beauty with a purpose kind of projects going into business so I wouldn't really say it's going to be a very um, a business that is formed to get profit but to regenerate that into like a um, a cause because you need actually money to do a lot of things so you've always been mentioning like diversity mm -hmm. or um, kind of tackling stereotypes is there a specific mission that you have in mind um, that tackles a specific social issue just for diversity it's very big in a way um, because it's it's a global keyword it's not just about japan or it's not just about tokyo or it's you know it's it's something that i think all us humans need to realize that we're all different and we've been saying that for years and years like we're all different we're unique we're good we need you know self-love and love yourself first and those things we've been saying it but we've been continuing to say it because we still need to say it because things haven't changed the way or faster enough that we want it to change um, but for me to change a huge amount of population or a, com a country I don't know if that's like possible in my lifetime but I want to share what I can share in my experience and what I feel and influence the people that are you know dealing with identity issues or people that are you know facing obstacles about you know not being able to love themselves or coexist or just be just not being able to com be comfortable being themselves and just living because we should it's life is super simple like you have to be happy mm -hmm. we need to be loved and we deserve all of that for our younger viewers who might be experiencing similar things that you've experienced what is the message that you would want to share with them the younger generation well I would love to learn more, you know, because, you know, they have different ideas. They're really open to a lot of things and I can learn so much from the younger generation. But um, I hope that they, they don't get too influenced by the old patterns. I hope that they can, you know, make the new era or, you know, develop more and, um, make good footprints but for that to happen i think our generation and the generations before need to open the doors and keep them open and not just you know have them face the same obstacles so we all face fear when we want to do new things or we want to challenge but um, if you feel fear i think it's it's worth trying and betting on that because that's a lot of potential there to change the future, so be fearless as well.